Stewart. Um, I want to go back to your, your three. You, you, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. <laughs> yeah. There was the third one, which is there's yeah. exceptions. And yeah. I want to, uh, there, here's my, yeah. here's my, here's my jam. Go for it. Omega-3 and vitamin D. Okay. Check, I, check. Good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so my uh, supplement shelf is small. Um, I live a lot further north than you do, so we get less useful sunshine. Definitely in the winter months, vitamin D is, uh, yep, absolutely. Um, so my question to you, being yeah. a muscle expert, right. and me, you know, uh, I guess people would call me an enthusiast. I, you know, I definitely try to follow the science, but there's widespread deficiency with vitamin D, Correct. no doubt. Yes. You know, across North America. Absolutely. So, yeah. um, and you know, it is a steroid hormone mm -hmm. that is doing similar things like testosterone in the sense where it's a binding receptor going into the cell nucleus yep. and regulating changing all kinds of genes yeah absolutely like five percent of the protein encoding human gene a lot absolutely so it's not just about bone homeostasis back no. to the rda but no. um with omega-3 yes i've so I've, I'm, i do read a lot of the literature yes. and um, i certainly don't always get things right but i've seen more than one I, i've yeah. seen a, probably a handful of studies now looking at Omega-3 supplementation and muscle mass, uh, specifically, I think there's older women, yep. uh, usually an older population, yes. but it, yep. it helping uh, with, I don't, I think it may be helping prevent some of the atrophy or yes. helping with in lean muscle mass. Yep. Is that a real uh, thing? It's, I mean, a, it's a real thing. I, I, like in our hands, uh, I had a, a postdoc, Chris McGlory, he, he left the lab uh, he, when he came he has a faculty position now at Queen's University, but when he came, he was an omega-3 guy, and he said, you know, we need to study more of this in, in human muscles. So we ran a trial, and we ran it actually in younger women, and then a bunch of people said, why do you only run it in women? I'm like, nobody ever asked you that, why you only ran it in men, right? So we, we did it in younger women for, for a number of reasons. There's not much research in younger women, and we did actually think that it might be more effective in women than men for reasons I don't fully understand, as you mentioned, older women there as well. Um, we supplemented one group with very high dose omega-3 fatty acids and we supplemented the other group with sort of a, a, a corn oil placebo and then we braced one of their legs for our local disuse atrophy model for two weeks and the women on the omega-3 supplement saw a really mild disuse atrophy response and then returned to normal much quicker than the other group who saw a much greater atrophic response and didn't get back to normal after two weeks of we call it passive remobilization. You remove the brace, you don't actively rehab, you're just like, go back, do all your normal things. Uh, so it's, it's, it's anti-catabolic for sure. It, it, the, you can have a nutritional intervention that can affect uh, disuse like that. that. That's a profound finding. So you can imagine with respect to our disuse, you know, uh, catabolic crisis model, lots more work to be done that's more chris's area he he, he left i'm like that's yours man you know go is he still it. doing it yeah he's still doing it i mean you know yep. here's the thing is that you have you, we have this aging population yep. and it is much easier as much as we want to get them to first and foremost can we get them to do any sort of resistance training yes obviously yes but that is a struggle especially for people that are much much older yep. um you know getting them to take a pill yes is one of the easiest things that yeah. you can do and yeah. you know you i would think there yeah omega-3 <laughs> is there there i think there's just been more and more evidence that it you know there's there's many benefits and i have i've talked about a lot of those but you know i mean yeah. the the anti-inflammatory resolving inflammation in so many different ways i mean there's like the specialized mediating uh, pro mediating molecules yeah. there's the resolvents the protectins the maricins i mean it's doing yeah you know it isn't just prostaglandins it's not no. just you know this one, no. you know, pathway. I mean, it's no. doing a lot of things. And yeah. what role does inflammation play? So inflammation, I know from reading your work, inflammation in a disease state like mm -hmm. cancer or, you know, type 2 diabetes or things like this, yeah. I mean, it can be catabolic, right? Absolutely. Yeah. What about the low-grade chronic inflammation, that unhealthy? Yeah, I, I think, the, you know, the, the disclaimer is, you know, we, we've learned a lot about how to make muscle more anabolic in, in young individuals and then we've extended that to healthy older individuals. We, 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 uh, we don't have older individuals participate in our study if they're on and the list of medications is relatively long. So they're probably the healthiest of the older population and so we're getting, we, we'd like to think that's a truer effect of aging rather than some meds that they're taking. But let me just say that uh, chronic low-grade inflammation, or what people call inflammaging, uh, is is problematic. It, it it's um, 
It's probably responsible for some of the anabolic resistance we talked about. Uh, we think so dampening the inflammation beforehand could, could help you get more anabolic. In extreme situations of, uh, you know, so I, ICU or, or cancer or, you know, particularly cancer cachexia where people are, you know, they're swimming in, in inflammatory cytokines and, you know, COVID gave us a, a little glimpse of uh, this cytokine storm that some people experience and, and they, the, the prognosis becomes very poor. So we think a lot of things, you know, nutritionally can combat muscle disuse, but if you have a patient that's on bed rest and in an ICU and they're, you know, massively inflamed, you can throw a lot of things nutritionally at these people and it's just dust in the wind. Nothing really happens. So, you know, the message is you've got to get inflammation under control before you're able to see the full and robust effect of a lot of the anabolic stimuli that we're talking about. So it is, it is an issue, and it's clearly something that uh, people need to, to think about as they get older. I'm actually of the mind that, um, you know, uh, the low-dose aspirin that a lot of people uh, are taking to sort of tamp down uh, inflammation is, is probably a good thing. But then also the flip side is to say there is some degree of inflammation that needs to happen. So if you keep chronically suppressing inflammatory responses in younger people even, I don't think you get a full adaptation. So some inflammation, good and necessary. Chronic low-grade inflammation, probably not good. Definitely rampant inflammation in, in, in all kinds of clinical states. Yeah, that's really going to take the edge off of anything that you do, both nutritionally and probably from an exercise perspective too. Yeah, that and what what you said makes a lot of sense. With obviously, you do want an inflammatory response when you're when you need it, right? I mean, when you're, you yeah. see a pathogen, and that is also why I, why I think omega three is one of the best ways to kind of lower the chronic inflammation because it has to do with resolving. The, yeah, in so many just, ways, the resolving of it, the it, inflammation. It's almost as if you're turning down the burner, right? You're just sort of you know t it's taking the edge off of that. So no, I agree. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then my last supplement to ask you about creatine monohydrate yeah. is yeah. that. Like, is that something, I mean, I've, I've, there's evidence that it seems to be beneficial for muscle growth, for brain yeah. health, yeah. but I, like, is there side effects? Is there worry? Like, is it, what, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, yeah. So I, again, short supplement shelf, uh, that's on there for me. Uh, I don't take it all the time. Uh, I have periods where I'm doing a lot of work. I try and sort of, you know, ramp up the volume of work that I'm doing. And, and I will add creatinine in at that time. Now I know a lot, of, I've got friends who will say, why aren't you taking it all the time? And I, I, I'm, I, I get it. Um, probably about 40 years old now. So as supplements go, it, it came and stayed, which makes it one of the number three categories. Uh, it, it sounds too good to be true. Its effects are pretty mild on muscle, but they're there. Um, they're potent. Uh, they last. Um, now the brain and the cognitive side of things is, is, you know, the evidence is growing in that area too. Um, if there were a danger with it, uh, I, you know, that, that, it was having, there was a lot of talk about it's damaging your kidneys, it's doing, you know, this, you shouldn't, you know, it's a, it's a guanidino compound, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we've got 40 years worth of data with people on the supplement now, and, and we're not seeing some sort of rife wave of, of people who used it um, getting various forms of cancer, et cetera, et cetera, which you would expect. 40 years is, is enough to, to see the effect. Um, all the data reviewing it from a safety standpoint uh, has given it two thumbs up. The adverse events are, uh, are rare, um, uh, usually in combination because people are taking not only that supplement but several others. Um, so, you know, pinning it on creatine per se uh, hasn't, hasn't shown any uh, credence. So, um, it definitely gets an A grade from the effectiveness standpoint. Uh, I think it's good for younger and older people. Um, I, I, I'm good with the health uh, or the safety side of things as well. Uh, I do think people, if they're going to try it, should do it sort of gradually. It used to be you'd take these big loading doses. And I think most people now, a uh, good friend of mine, Mark Tarnopolsky, neuromuscular physician, has all of his neuromuscular patients on it. So I think that that's a fairly robust endorsement of what it can do for people with compromised muscle function. And he recommends that these people just start with a, a dose of about, you know, four to five grams of creatine a day. 
What is he, what is he using it like exactly for? Well, I mean, all these people have is one of their overriding symptoms, no matter what they have, whether it's a mitochondrial myopathy or some sort of dystrophy condition is muscle weakness. Mm -hmm. So uh, people do get a little bit of a boost. It may not be, you know, something that you or I would consider worthy, but if you're somebody who's close to that line where, you know, disability is here and ability is here, then creatine could be what it is that pushes you over that line. So. He's, um, uh, you know, uh, I think one, and, and again, you can go and read his papers. Uh, they're, they're pretty uh, robust studies done in all kinds of populations. And so, uh, yeah, try it, see what you think. Um, most people tolerate it very well. You don't need a fancy brand of it. Uh, the stuff they sell at Costco or whatever is just as good as anything else. The monohydrate form is the one to, uh, to aim for, don't be fooled by creatine, insert your favorite derivative. Um, monohydrate is, is the one that's been most studied and, and so probably the one you wanna go for, for sure. And it's good to know, so you don't actually have to be physically active to reap any benefits from it. And that, that was the no. question I had because, yeah. I mean, again, thinking of parents and yeah. grandparents yeah, yeah, yeah. and, yeah. right? I mean, that's, that's yeah. the, the uh, issue with the yeah. ones that are not physically active yeah, absolutely. or that I mean, there's, there's people that walk their dogs and stuff, which is good. That right. at least gives them some physical activity. But yep. you don't have to be pumping iron and stuff. To, no, you, no, you don't. Because I always thought uh, about it yeah. that way. I'm like, well, I'm not like a gym rat, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. do I need it? I mean... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, I, I mean, I think, the, you know, the stuff now with creating it that they're uncovering that makes me think maybe this should be part of my regular routine actually has less to do with the muscle and more to do with the brain and the cognitive yeah. performance that it, it, you know, can, it's come back several times now, improves. And, you know, uh, you mentioned I'm the director of PACE. Uh, it, it has a special place in my heart. And, and the truth is, is that uh, you talk to people in PACE, um, we, our, our oldest participant is 104. Uh, so I, I consider him to be the icon of wisdom. And, you, and, and people talk about when they get older from a health standpoint, they, they want to be a burden. And that always when you unpack it is round, I, I don't want for somebody to have to take care of me because my physical capacity has gone down or that my mental capacity has gone down. They all fear that. So it's, it's dementia and then it's physical inability to do things. And so I say, well, you're here working on the physical ability and but you're working on the dementia too. And they say, well, what else can I do? I said, well, here's a list of sort of things and uh, by no means a dementia expert, but uh, creatine might be something that older people might wanna talk about for sure.